I welcome you all to the first day of the Obeid Siddiqui Lectures 2023 by Professor G. N. Devi. And just a quick announcement that students who want participation certificates, please register at the desk outside. And I now invite Dr. Shahana Das, who is Professor of Practice at the Department of Communication Studies, to please say a few words. Thank you. Good evening, everybody. Um, it's my privilege to begin this three-day session of such eminence uh, in the field of linguistics. Um, when I was asked to say a few words as an opening, uh, I thought I will research languages in India, and I could not find a single scholar or website or article or journal or institute who could give me an authoritative number on how many languages there are in India. So I thought I will speak, share with you a little bit about uh, my own experience with language. Because you see, my parents come from two different languages and I knew both languages. And our man Friday spoke a third language and I just grew up with three languages at home and English in, in school. And in, I don't think that as a child I even thought about it. So the choice of language came from who I was facing. So I would look at my mom and start the sentence in one language, turn my head, look at my dad and finish it in another language. And that was quite okay. And then uh, after a few years, I found that I had a fair number of uh, you know, friends who came from Tamil Nadu and spoke Tamil. And they had lovely grandparents who loved me and along with the taste for having curd rice with pickle, which is um, blasphemy for a Bengali who has it with sugar. So I have ever since had um, curd rice with pickle. But along with that, I also picked up a smattering of Tamil. So when we were posted in um, Chennai for a little while, I decided to show off my Tamil. And I was frowned at because Apparently, my Tamil is full of Malayalam words because most of my friends were from Palgat. Uh, and I realized that even the Oriya that I grew up speaking um, is not only seen by its region, which is Katak, but also became a caste marker because the words I used to talk, to refer to my uncle or aunt, is a caste marker. And I realized that language is more than the label we know it as. Um, the point also is that along with all these varied languages, I even tried to um, learn Kannada uh, enough to yell at the traffic policeman outside for not doing his job. And he kept saying, English gotila. So I said, um, English gotila, Hindi gotila, duty gotu. So that was enough Kannada for me uh, to um, manage, you see. But along with all of that, there is this overwhelming language called English. Uh, the reason I'm saying it's called English is that this language that we are using right now can be understood only by us. And we have created a language that is very unique to us. And phrases like born and brought up or uh, for what joy uh, is very clear to us. Uh, so is it English? the way, let's say, the Queen speaks it? Is it English the way uh, Bill Gates speaks it? It is our English. Is it dominating everything else? Because I dream in English, I fight in English, I'm most comfortable yelling in English. Um, but this is a very unique English. It's my English. And I realize that my ability to learn and understand and feel curious about many languages has opened the windows for me to understand many ways of thinking and many minds. And I think the wonder of Indians is that we take multilingual uh, cultures and multilingual contexts very normally. And it's very beautiful. Uh, and why it is very difficult to transfer one piece of writing or creativity into another. And I especially feel that when I've been asked to translate a humorous piece in Bengali into English, and I find I'm stumbling. But the ability to know multiple languages also opens the door for many things uh, in humor itself. For example, if somebody says, 
what do you mean? I often say something fishy. Uh, now you have to know Malayalam to understand what that joke is. So as you can, as many of my students here will remember, I am a bit of a pundit. But before I continue with more puns, I think I'll hand over to the real pundit here. We are all eagerly looking forward to listening to you speak and looking forward to learning from you. Welcome, sir. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thank you so much for being here. And on behalf of all of us uh, from NCBS, I really want to thank uh, all of you here at Mount Carmel. Uh, this has been extraordinary, the, the kind of uh, work that all of you have put in. Uh, so thank you again. The credit goes to all of you. Uh, my name is Venkat. I'm part of the team at uh, the archives at NCBS. And I just wanted to give a couple of words about uh, what an archive is and what we do, because it might not be necessarily something that all of us have waded through uh, in the course of our lives. Uh, the Archive at NCBS is a public collecting center for the history of science um, in contemporary India. Um, that's mainly what we do. We collect, we identify, we collect, we preserve, and we try and make it accessible to the public at large. You can come and check out our website, which is archives.ncbs.res.in, or uh, hopefully you would be uh, motivated to come by to the actual archive, which is about 40 minutes north, depending on traffic. Um, and do come pay us a visit. Uh, we'd love to come, uh, we'd love to have you um, come over. Uh, there are a couple of other things that we do besides the archiving itself. Uh, we are a site of education, so we do run an internship program. We train students, we train uh, scholars in, in totally building a sensibility around the archive. Uh, we do our own research uh, in terms of archival theory and practice, um, and uh, this is something uh, this, uh, that uh, we'll talk about a little more later. And uh, finally, we also uh, are a site to sort of bring broader awareness uh, and understanding around the archive public engagement that we do. Um, uh, we, uh, we started the, the Obeid Siddiqui chair, which I'm going to um, call on my um, former center director, Jitu Mayer, to talk about. And uh, the Siddiqui chair is one of the components of the areas of research uh, that is sort of stationed at the archives at NCBS. And we've been absolutely delighted to have Professor and Devi with us for this last year. So without further ado, I'm going to call on uh, Satyajit Mayer, the former center director of NCBS and the chair of the review committee um, uh, that called upon uh, Jay and Devi to be the chair for this year. Jitu. Well, uh, firstly, you know, it's terrific to be here and thank you so much, uh, um, Dr. Das and Mount Carmel College for helping to arrange this. A uh, set of three lectures from Professor Devi, our second uh, Obeid CDP chair. <clears throat> well, I'd also like to welcome all of you uh, to this lecture, the Obeid Siddiqui, uh, of the Obeid Siddiqui chair in the history and culture of science. But before I begin to tell you about the role of the chair, uh, I must say a few words about the Obeid uh, Siddiqui himself, um, whose name and whose name and whose memory. Uh, we have instituted this chair. Uh, Obeid was born uh, in 1932 in Pasti in Uttar Pradesh, uh, one, of the, one of seven uh, remarkable children, five of whom were women of extremely extraordinary accomplishment and who would all share a common commitment to social transformation that Obeid himself was so emblematic of. Uh, Obeid um, studied at the Aligarh Muslim University in the late 40s and early 50s, and even spent time in jail uh, in the, in the uh, 50s uh, for, his, for his social activism. However, fortunately for uh, science, uh, his fascination with biology lured him away uh, from uh, this kind of activism, but he never lost his sense of social justice and equity. Uh, Obeid spent uh, then several years in the UK and in, then in the USA. Um, and his, uh, I must say, his easy confidence, uh, which came from a combination of both background uh, and achievement, as well as an impersonal focus on the question at hand, uh, led him to return to India in uh, the, in, 19, in the 1960s uh, to help in building modern biology in this country. 
starting with the molecular biology unit at TIFR in the 1960s. Uh, uh, he then uh, took on uh, building a center for the biological science, which today we call the National Center for Biological Science, uh, located in Bangalore, as Venkat mentioned, at the other, other end of the city near the airport. Um, well, what is now the airport? We were there long before the airport was built. Um, uh, Obed uh, accomplished all this uh, under the umbrella of the Tata Institute for Fundamental Research, uh, where he eventually served uh, as professor, professor emeritus, uh, and he was based uh, at NCBS uh, in this in this uh, uh, capacity until his untimely device in 2013. So that's almost uh, 10 years ago. Uh, Obed leaves behind NCBS uh, as one of his many legacies. Uh, it is today uh, a world-class institution, uh, deeply engaged with exploring biology across our scale, uh, from molecules to ecosystems, uh, with a profoundly interdisciplinary lens, uh, and <clears throat> has also spawned many other institutions, like a good uh, biology-focused uh, institution should. Uh, it has uh, spawned the uh, Institute for Stem Cell uh, uh, and Regenerative Science and Regenerative Medicine, uh, which is a place for biomedical translation. Uh, the Center for Cell and Molecular Platforms, uh, India, one of India's top biotech incubators, uh, uh, which is uh, all in partnership with the Department of Biotechnology, which again uh, is a somewhat remarkable fact that two departments of the government, the Department of Atomic Energy and the Department of Biotechnology would in fact come together to do something. Um, uh, it also today is a home for the Tata Institute for Genetics and Society, yet another institute. So, so you know, so what we had seeded at that time has led to many, many things uh, at the uh, just a stone's throw away from here. Uh, but I must say, all these efforts are a testimony to the founding principles of open-minded inquiry and societal engagement that Obed uh, embodied. Uh, we therefore felt a need to create a chair uh, who would lead a much needed effort to bridge the gap between the sciences, social sciences and the humanities, and foster a diverse and inclusive community of academics across disciplines. With this focus and the ar archives as a foundational hub, uh, we imagine that the cha chair would also build teaching and research capacity of academics at the intersection of the science and humanities. A key component of this is, in fact, the delivering of these set of lectures. Uh, and I'm sure you find these set of lectures uh, co uh, completely reflective of, of the, of the uh, wishes that we have of the chair. Uh, we have had some amazing uh, people who uh, wanted to uh, serve as the uh, as uh, the Obeid Siddiqui Chair, and amongst those remarkable people, we had to make a choice. Um, and I can't tell you how happy we are that uh, Professor, uh, Professor Ganesh Devi uh, decided to take this up upon our offer. Um, well, you're going to hear more about uh, Ganesh Devi from uh, my colleague, uh, Professor Varama Krishnan, in a moment, so I will not uh, say much more about that. But I would like to thank uh, <coughs> Uh, my colleagues, in fact, on the review committee, uh, Janaki Nair, uh, Ramachandra Buha, Sanjeev Jain, uh, P. Balaram, Janaki Palke, uh, and Omar Ramakrishnan, uh, as well as the now, the now new director of NCBS, uh, Professor El Shashidara, who is sitting right here, uh, as well as our, in, uh, well, our sort of irrepressible head of the archives, uh, Venkat, uh, and see, um, Samira, who, without whom we would not be listening to Professor Devi today. So this chair was made possible by generous support from the TNQ Technologies uh, and the foresight of its chairperson and managing director, Miriam Ram, who also knew and admired Obey and all that he stood for. Um, I, I thank, uh, in addition to her, his her uh, CEO, Abhi, Abhigan, the uh, who has also supported us in more ways than I can describe here. With that, um, well, thank you all for coming, and I'm sure you are in for a terrific treat over the next three days. Uh, let me welcome Uma to introduce uh, Professor Devi. Thank you. Hi, 
everyone. Really wonderful to see uh, such a full audience. So I'll just take a couple of minutes to introduce Professor Devi. So Professor Ganesh and Devi is a recipient of the second Ubaid Siddiqui Chair in the History and Culture of Science uh, at the Archives at NCBS. A renowned literary, literary, literary scholar, historian, and social and cultural activist, he's perhaps best known uh, for establishing the People's Linguistic Survey of India, or the PLSI. In addition to the PLSI, uh, Professor Devi founded the Adivasi Academy and Bhasha Research and Publication Center, an organization dedicated to studying and conserving Indian languages, championing tribal art and literature, and uplifting Adivasi communities through educational and financial assistance. Really wonderful to see that combination of uh, scholarship and activism. <clears throat> During his time at NCBS, he has been involved in work on the prehistory and history of Indian civilization from a linguistic perspective, dating back uh, 12,000 years ago. In fact, on July 18th, just very recently, at the Bangalore International Center, there was also a book launch of his co-edited volume uh, titled The Indians, Histories of a Civilization, which he co-edited uh, with uh, Tony Joseph and Dr. Ravi Gorisatar is also here. He also ran a course uh, at, while at NCBS, The People of India, that brought together various disciplines, genetics, prehistory, archaeology, linguistics, philosophy, cultural studies, and literature, to provide a unique and comprehensive picture of how we have evolved for millennia as a people uh, of many origins, languages, and worldviews, and cultural identities. He has also conducted several monthly informal discussions. I'm sure as students you'll really appreciate that. The opportunity for all of us has been amazing to uh, interact with him in an informal setting uh, at the archives on a variety of issues that concern society today at large. Many times we have all of these things we wonder about, but no, way to, no spaces to discuss these issues. And just yesterday, he led a second, the second edition of um, you know, a seminar that brought together scientists from across India, from various uh, institutions and disciplines, to understand the meaning of what doing science in India means today. The Obeid Siddiqui uh, Chair delivers a set of three lectures, um, and sorry, delivers a set of lectures in the second half of their time at NCBS. And we're really delighted and we look forward to hearing Professor Davies' lectures, three lectures today, tomorrow, and the day after uh, at Mount Carmel College on India as a linguistic civilization with a focus on heritage, that's today, uh, diversity, that's tomorrow, and the future, very aptly uh, phrased, that's on Saturday. So thanks very much and uh, 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 welcome Professor Davy. look forward to hearing you. Professor Das and the academic community at Mount Carmel. Professor Shashidhar, director of NCBS. Professor Satyajit Mayer, former director and the chair, uh, the, uh, the, the chairperson of the chair committee for the chair, uh, the chair of chair. <laughs> All colleagues from NCBS who, who travel long distance despite rains and this odd hour of the day. I'm absolutely delighted to be here, to have this opportunity of speaking for today, tomorrow and the after on the question of India, civilization and language. But let me begin with your permission by mentioning St. Carmel, not the college, but the St. Carmel. Uh, sorry, Mount Carmel, I'm sorry. Mount Carmel, uh, which is about 35, 40 kilometers mountain range in Israel, north part, and which is recognized by UNESCO as a World Heritage Site. It was recognized by UNESCO as the World Heritage Site because some time back in archaeological excavation, 
archaeologists found the some time back archaeologists found in their excavation a skeleton some time back archaeologists found in their excavation a skeleton of somebody like a human but belonging to a time which is 3 lakh years ago and that's a lot of time we also found that a human like population neanderthal perhaps was there uh, in and around mount karmel and that is not enough of a reason for this recognition there were additional reasons and that is in the uh, mythology of theology uh elia is associated with uh, mount karmel just as for moses that's mount sinai for elia it's mount karmel several orders of theological congregation were established there and of course one order or in indian parallel i may call a sect was uh, the uh, the order devoted to the mediterranean the sea the second which came almost a thousand years later uh, was yet another led by a saint or a spiritual leader called just b uh, a third one slightly different and that is bahai so very vast spiritual heritage and a large number of stories and historical events associated with mount karmel make it a place to be proud of by everybody in the world and so it is a universal heritage recognized by unesco Now in that story of Mount Carmel, the several languages involved. There is of course Hebrew. There is the old variety of Arabic. There is the Armenian language. Uh, there are newer languages that came uh, during the Ottoman Empire and uh, in the uh, colonial times through greater contact with the modern West. it has it is a kind of a meeting point of civilizations next door is egypt and when one thinks of civilizations uh, we cannot uh, you know forget mentioning egypt uh, there is cyprus which is actually what the old greeks ancient greeks would have recognized as greece and not as cyprus so there is the greek civilization the egyptian civilization and to the south east of it a vast expanse called asia which gave rise in its western part to the ottoman uh, sorry uh, to the mesopotamian to akkadian and several other civilizational upsurges upsurges so mount carmel knows what civilization is and therefore today when i speak to you i thought discussing civilization in your presence would not be inappropriate i feel equally happy <laughs> equally happy and silence is superior to speech thank you but what is this uh, thing called civilization i mean mount carmel i can understand and you can understand go to a geography book go to a tourist shop uh, i mean you will find uh, go to uh, your dear friend google you will find a lot uh, what is this civilization it is not an empire it is not a nation it is not a tradition 
is something uh, very different. And uh, while uh, all over the world today, uh, if there are a little over 200 nations, uh, we don't associate that term civilization with every nation, though the land on which those nations are located are as old as the earth. That's uh, uh, what your uh, 4.5, 4.3 billion years uh, uh, old. So the earth is one. It's as old anywhere as it is anywhere else. And yet, not all nations uh, uh, manage to get the epithet of civilization. We think of the Egyptian civilization, Greek civilization, Indian civilization. What is this idea of civilization? It is not a nation. Is it an empire? No, there was a Roman Empire, but we don't think of a Roman civilization. There was a Mughal Empire, we don't think of a Mughal civilization. The civilization, as I understand, of course, <coughs> the easiest way is to go to the root of the term. Civil, in Latin, relates to a city. So establishing a city would should qualify for the term civilization. But while Bangalore was established 400 years ago, we still do not have a Bangalore civilization. I mean, I hope one day, now the airport and NCBS are there, and of course, Mahum Khan someday. But this civilization thing started not, not as the thing itself, but a kind of a description of the thing. I'm trying to say that civilization does not exist, but some people recognize as something that existed in the past particularly as civilization. Of course, we do use in popular uh, uh, language uh, the expression modern civilization or technological, civil, industrial civilization and so on. Uh, but uh, that, is, uh, that is quite distinct from the way uh, when we use the term civilization together with Egypt or, uh, uh, or Greece. Sometime towards the end of the 17th century in Europe, when people had started going out of Europe to other continents and had started encountering different people, but people who were not less in accomplishment than the Europeans, not inferior, but different, and had managed to attain certain, certain civilizational heights, heights in sophistication of variety of uh, type. For describing those, the term civilization came in a big way. In England, the trend started uh, after uh, the, uh, a, a very famous book called The Decline and Fall of the Roman Empire. While Gibbon's book, which some students might have heard about, or uh, maybe a few might have actually seen the book, or uh, I fear gave it also. Uh, Gibbon's book did not speak of civilization. But Edward Gibbon did create a mood of getting excited about the past and particularly the greatness in the past. See, uh, after the Protestant uh, in the movement came in, in Europe, the past was seen as dark ages. The med medieval times were seen as Europe, Europe's dark ages. All these centuries of uh, the fights between Muslims and Christians were seen as a pointless waste of human energy. Gibbon lifted the spirit of Europe and tried to show that everything in the past was not bad, everything was not a decline, but there were peaks of achievement. It is in that excitement about the past, in the mood to admire the past, 
a little over admire the past, I'll say, excessive admiration for the past, that the term civilization took root in the social and historical discourse of Europe. And so, somebody who was in his teens, when Gibbon had become great passion, having come to India, started looking, and having started looking at the past of languages, suddenly thought of using the term civilization. That was William Jones. End of the 18th century, William Jones is saying, look, my Latin and my Greek and your Persian and your Sanskrit almost look alike. So is it possible that they all come from a single mother? Jones, who had come to India at a fairly young age, he was only 24 when he landed in India, 24 maybe, 25, uh, uh, and had studied Greek and Latin back home, and uh, uh, tried to get uh, some Persian, a little bit of Arabic and Sanskrit after coming here, suddenly started noticing a lot of similar, similar words. And so he created a hypothesis. It was guesswork. He guessed. It was a wild guess. There was no evidence. But as in science, you, know, you make a guess, you build a hypothesis which can be tested later by later generations. Um, William Jones proposed that possibility of a mother of all these different languages should not be ruled out and we must look in that direction of finding out the root, the origin of all these languages. Till then, uh, in European uh, students of scholars of language and linguistics, the idea of a single origin was very dominant. And it was derived obviously from, as you know, the story of the Tower of Babel, that there was one language and then it fragmented into many languages. That was the, uh, as scientists call it, uh, the, uh, the dominant paradigm, the governing paradigm at that time. And so Jones started looking at not the differences between the languages. He did not look at how these different languages evolved. They had evolved. He started looking at how these different different languages were united at the source. So, uh, in that search, some decades later, when linguists found that there was actually a sample and evidence of literature which could go back to about 1500 years before Christ but evidence in oral tradition, the Vedas. They suddenly said, I mean, this is the 19th century scholars, and uh, if you like, you can uh, rush through the 19th century, come to the end of that century with someone like uh, Friedrich Max Muller, uh, who said that we are in the 19th century, but nearly 1400 years before Christ, and that's uh, add 19, to, with, to 14, that's a long time, more than 3,000 years ago, the people who could think about the cosmos, think about life, think about the world in the loftiest possible manner. So they said this is the earliest sample of language and literature. And with that as the central point, they started going out to see if the pre-Christian Greek and Latin had any connections with that language. So the whole exercise became comparing one language with another, finding out parallels, and uh, kind of drawing uh, a, a map of the connect connections between these languages. Uh, doing all this, they came to the conclusion that India had a great civilization in the past. Students will ask me this question as to why Max Muller or William Jones did not say that India has a civilization. 
the answer is very obvious. The British had to justify their presence here, and therefore they had to claim that they were here to civilize the Indians, re-civilize if you like to, if you like to say so. Because without that, their presence had no other justification. Having uh, acquired control over the entire territory, Burma, Sri Lanka, India, now Bangladesh, what is now Bangladesh, Pakistan, parts of Afghanistan, uh, they looked at their own God-given mission as the mission to civilize Indians. So their, their sense of history was, yes, India had a great civilization in the past, then it declined, and uh, now with modern knowledge, Western knowledge, it, the civilization will flourish once again. This is how the term civilization was attached to the Indian context. With Egypt, the story was different. The Greeks had gone to Egypt and found pyramids almost 3,000 years before our time, where they learned that the pyramids were built another thousand years before that time. And they came back in great admiration for the sense of trigonometry, geometry, study of lights and shadows. And uh, they started talking of the Egyptian civilization. So the word Egyptian civilization was given to us by the Greeks. Indian civilization was given to us by the British. Other civilizations, in Western Asia were the result of a lot of archaeological excavation, but more important, even more important than that, was a great interest in metallurgy and uh, science related to arms. How metal was used, how kingdoms were formed, how arms were used, what was the warfare technique, all those things. The net result of all this curiosity, I mean in uh, Sanskrit there is an expression, Athato Brahma Jignasa, great curiosity about the entire universe. So out of this great curiosity about the entire world, these terms got associated with some, some uh, people, some nations, some points in the past history, in, in, in historical times, in human past. Therefore, civilization is only an idea, is only a descriptive label selectively used depending on when and who coined that label. Uh, there is nothing like or any objective set of criteria to decide what is a civilization and what is a non-civilization. With that caveat, let me turn to the question of language. But I must also say why I want to turn to the question of language. With the Egyptian civilization, the essence, the heart of that civilization was an idea that in, over, in some oversimplified terms, I can say was a geomet idea in geometry, a triangle, a triangle. And I am not seeing this triangle because they constructed pyramids. And they did, and uh, pyramids are amazing things, uh, still continue to be one of the wonders uh, universally. But I am thinking of a triangle in philosophical terms. They interpreted existence in terms of a triangle, that is, there is a divine or unknown power, power unknown to us, unknown to us humans, and it has its own realm, its own universe, its own uh, existence, own dynamics. Then we are there, but between that and us, there is a third point in the way the Egyptians imagined the society. And that point was uh, a class of people called the pharaohs. The pharaohs could understand God's language, it seems. 
they could also understand human languages. But the others did not understand God's languages. And therefore, the Pharaoh was allowed to interpret what God says. So this guy, I mean, uh, one of the persons belonging to this class, would sit next to the idol of God, a uh, temple, temple. And uh, when somebody approached, would interpret what God was saying. And if, if the Pharaoh did not listen to God's voice at that particular moment, whatever the Pharaoh said became God's voice. It was an arrangement, a social arrangement. It was a political arrangement. But it was it it became the heart of the civilization in Egypt. I do not know if the term Purohit in Sanskrit is derived from the term Pharaohs in, in Egypt. I, uh, I but uh, it's more or less similar kind of arrangement. Of course, in much changed circumstances. A person who understood the future and the past, who could understand you, your mind, your life, without you having to express yourself. The Pharaohs did not like or want people to speak to them. They just wanted people to listen to them, as I am doing now. The Greek civilization was not based on this triangular relationship. It worked in terms of parallel lines. And this is even funnier, I mean quite uh, 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 interesting, but uh, amusing. The Greeks thought that the sky, the Greek physics, let, let me call them uh, people who understood physics or astrophysics since we are in the city where Raman Institute is, astrophysics. The Greeks thought that the sky is not the ultimate ceiling on the top of our heads, our head tops. There is something beyond that. And the sky has perforations of holes in it. I mean, if you look at the ceiling here, the lights coming, the two lights of the uh, Greeks felt that light percolates down through those holes. And which were these holes? The stars that they saw at night were seen as absence, not as presence, as lack of lack of substance rather than uh, some you know uh, some different substance. The Greeks believed and truly believed every inch of their being they believe that the world above the skies we see is full of light all time I mean they don't need a government to give them 200 units free it's completely free and forever from the beginning to the end never fading light the Greeks also believed as if the universe was like a box a shoe box if you like they believed that under the earth there is an area which is full of darkness. And their scientific explanation was that no light ever comes from beneath the earth to the human world. Now, uh, this would have been all right, but then they went a step further. And they said, the light from above and the darkness from below create a shadow for every substance. And that shadow became a great philosophical problem for all Greeks. When you will study, I mean this is for students, whenever in future you study Plato's writings, you will find in Plato a cave man standing at the, who has never seen anything outside. He just walks to the mouth of the cave. But he turns back because this very sharp light coming in, he sees his own long shadow falling inside the cave, feels very scared. He says, I am here, the cave is here, the light, but from where has the shadow come? Who is the shadow? Is it life or is it death? What is the source? And can I dissociate my body from that shadow? For humans it was not possible. 
No substance could be dissociated from its shadow. The Greeks developed all fields of knowledge in terms of the substance versus shadow, the virtual versus physical. And today we are deeply engaged in developing a virtual world, and it's a Greek person. It's a shadowy world, virtual world, and, and very soon all of us will, uh, will no longer be bodies. Already we are reduced to our digital Aadhaar card number, or various numbers, uh, and uh, very soon we will only be uh, non-substantial, -subs non non-physical, virtual presences. Those presences will matter more than we matter as bodies. I mean, you know some of you, if you punch the card at 9 or 8 in the morning, the body can go out but the shadow can stay on the campus, and yet that is counted as a single day. Am I wrong? <laughs> the, this is the Greek tradition of knowledge. The Greek civilization was based on the idea of dichotomy, opposition between the shadow and the substance. So the Egyptians are working with the cosmos, with the world universe, uh, in terms of a figure, a diagram, a triangle. The Greeks are working with the uh, existence in terms of this uh, non-reconcilable parallel lines of the world of light and the world of this, the eyes, this, the uh, death, uh, darkness. What did the Indian civilization do? What was the basis of that civilization? Was it, was duality, dichotomy the basis of Indians as in the Greek civilization? Was some unifying diagram such as a circle, a triangle, a square, or what was that great abstraction that Indians found as the unifying idea for all people that were there when the Indian civilization first emerged? I said, I will tell you, I said I am turning to the question of language and I also said I will tell you why I am turning to that question. I am turning to that question because in my opinion, considered opinion, language or sound or voice is what brings the Indian civilization into existence. And from now on, till Saturday evening, I'll be elab elaborating this idea. First, uh, let me explain what I understand by language. Of course, I know names of some languages. When I arrived here this afternoon, I was asking uh, young friends uh, which languages they speak. They told me it was Th Tamil, Telugu, Kannada, Hindi, Marathi, Gujarati. Uh, and so on. I also ask them in which language or languages they dream and uh, they were thinking about whether to give away personal information or not. <laughs> so, but they gave me some because out of politeness they, they did respond to my question. I did not push them any further into embarrassing areas. Uh, I'm not thinking of language as our class five or class standard five or standard six teacher thinks of language as a set of grammatical rules. I am not thinking of language as professional linguists who define language uh, think of language. I mean, what do professional linguists do? The most standard definition, I mean, you open any standard text of linguistics and in the first chapter there is a definition of what is language just as in the first chapter of book of physics they define what is matter the definition that linguistics gives is language is an arbitrary system of science arbitrary because nobody's had nobody had choice in selecting those signs uh, there is no predictability about those signs. 
they change. There is one cannot anticipate which science will enter language. But saying this is saying absolutely nothing about language. Uh, since they cannot define what that system is, they use the term arbitrary system. So arbitrary system is almost like a foolish wisdom. It's a paradox. I'm not looking at language as a system of grammar, as a set of words, as, uh, as a set of rules. Uh, I'm looking at language slightly differently. And uh, my view is, uh, let me use a slightly difficult word. I do not know if my consciousness, my chitta, my self-awareness, my awareness of the, you know, what is wrong, my, whether my, I'm not talking of the conscience, I'm talking of consciousness. I do not know if my consciousness is there or a hallucination that I accepted for my convenience. And worse still, in any case, a person today is hardly a person it's a, it's a set of brands put together, stapled together. But uh, I'm not getting to that. Worst still is, you know, uh, the world spread outside one's mind. Uh, German philosopher Immanuel Kant uses the term the phenomenal world, the world of phenomena. Phenomena is a plural, phenomenon is singular. Uh, these days, they say a lot of mix up with that. The phenomenal, the world outside us, from here to the ultimate horizon, from here to the highest skies, deepest seas, the world surround, surrounding us. I am not sure if it is really there. If it is really there the way I see it. Now, given these two uncertainties, I don't know if my consciousness is a myth. Uh, I'm doping myself, it's, it's, it's a kind of false belief. I don't know what the world outside is. What I know for sure is there is a bridge connecting the two. And that bridge is language. And that bridge is available in a very sophisticated, advanced form only to homo sapiens humans. is available to the animal that uses very complex language which can express extremely complex perception of time and perception of space. I don't know how many of you actually met two tigers at the same time or two elephants. But uh, about with elephants, I'm not so sure. But with tigers, I can say. Uh, uh, so Uma will tell me more about it. When two tigers meet, can they exchange the sentiment, which says, ten years back when we were in that another forest, things were better. They were cheaper. Now inflation has gone. They won't be able to bring in so much of past in their expression. In the experiential world, yes, of course, they have memory. When the smallest bug, smallest ant will have that kind, every cell of every being will have that memory, chemical memory or whatever it is. But humans have created the idea of time. Time does not exist. There is no objective existence for time. We imagine time. We first imagined it and then we learned to master it with the help of language. It is humans alone who can use a very strange structure like the past tense 
I was very happy till last year. Only humans can say. But I don't know if birds say that. Though birds also have some articulation language. Language for humans is a weapon, a method, a bridge, allowing them to bring together a very vast range of experience. Let me take one step, you know, uh, let me go ahead one step further. Supposing in the brain, you heard that term, uh, uh, this is for students, I must say. You heard the term brain? Yeah, good. I mean, so I am so amazed, so many of you are still at it. In the brain, if there are uh, neurons, which bring, I mean, when I touch this bottle, some neurons tell me that it, it is hard, it is transparent, it contains uh, water. <laughs> billions of them, I don't know, biologists tell me almost 80, 85,000 billion, 85 billion water neurons work in the brain. Language actually does the same work outside the brain for humans. It captures the texture, the tone, the, the, the dynamics of things and brings that knowledge. It's not neurons analyze language. And so, uh, so uh, we have the ability in one part of the brain to analyze those signals. For me, language is a substance which allows us to be human. To have language is to be human. So I'm not talking about set of rules or set of words, but the humanness of humans is what language is in one in one sense. Now that's so I'll go ahead from there. I was saying that language is the essential stuff or attribute of Indian civilization. And this is very difficult to accept just now. Because, but if I were to ask you a, a, a different question, I mean, what is it, what is, what is it that brings India into being as India? Is it our territory? Is it our past? Is it our metaphysical or religious philosophy? Is it our social set of social habits? None of these questions can satisfactorily explain why and how we are Indians. Because we have many religions, sets, many philosophies, and our geography is very diverse. And the map of India has been changing uh, over centuries very, very frequently. Today it is some map. Maybe after 50 years, 100 years, it could be another map carrying that. So there is no permanence there. But, it, but Indian behavior of language behavior, the way Indians cope with language, the way Indians generate language, that is unique. You will ask me why I am not saying the same thing with the Egyptians or with the Greeks. The answer is that, uh, that, uh, that the time when the Egyptian civilization, what we call the Egyptian civilization came up, technologies humans use were of one kind. The time when the Greek civilization came up, the technologies used by humans were of another kind. The time when Indian civilization came up, the technologies that people use were of yet another kind. In that technology, language took front seat as far as India is concerned. And therefore, our civilization got shaped from the question of language. Just as in modern Europe, technology, that is, last 400 years, 
shaped the world differently and so we call it technological industrial civilization. Don't ask me the question as to which was the Indian language. Did we not have one language out of which hundreds of languages uh, came up? Because that question makes absolutely no sense if you look at the history of people in India. Genetics tells us that Homo sapien, Homo sapien is that arrogant animal uh, which thinks that it has brains, I mean it has, it is very intelligent. Homo sapien is intelligent man. Look at the history of people in India. Uh, genetics tells us that Homo sapien, Homo sapien is that arrogant animal uh, which thinks that it has brains, I mean it has, it is very intelligent. Homo sapien is intelligent man. Actually, the Neanderthal found in uh, Mount Carmel uh, was uh, also differently, equally intelligent. But we survived. The worst among, there were many kinds of humans, but the one that survived was the worst among all of them. And the worst always survives, as you know. All the best people in the world know that. The Homo sapien moved out of Africa weaponized language for securing advance during that migration and eventually arrived in this part of the world just as beyond this part of the world the, the homo sapien also went to uh, Australia uh, through Russia to the what is now the United States the Americas and so on uh, went to Europe all over the world The movement or migration of the ancient modern man, genetics calls these people modern man, and the ancient, very ancient modern man, the movement started in search of food, not in search of energy or shelter, in search of food. And so this People who wanted to go grab, hunt and collect, hunt and eat, hunters and gatherers, they were moving uh, along the line, developing small tools, instruments. Sometimes they were made of little, you know, stones, rocks and so on. The, the Homo sapiens reach this continent maybe about 65 to 70,000 years ago. People in the Andaman have, scientists tell me, have moved there some 65,000 years before our time. From Africa, I mean they did not of course go uh, by buses or trains or planes, there were no planes or buses or trains. They walked along the coastal land. Prior to, there were many times when the weather was very cold and there were other times when the weather was sufficiently warm for people to make movements. The last such very uh, significantly destructive cold age lasted for about 7,000 years from 18,000 years before uh, uh, our time to about 12,000 years before our time. But 12,000 years before our time, the climate change and uh, if you look at the earth as a globe, uh, closer to the poles, the climate obviously was very cold, it was all snow capped part of the earth, but closer to the equator where there is greater sun, as the, as the snows melted, people moving in, 10 degrees north of equator, 10 degrees south of equator, there was greater possibility of life. We kind of, you know, fall in that zone. And so people who came here found enough animal, bird and plant food for their survival. They stayed on. Some of them moved ahead and found another camp. These small groups of nomadic hunter-gatherers 
forming camps and habitation formed uh, what anthropologists call population knots, K N O T S, population bunch, bunch of people. And uh, these bunches were sufficiently large to defend, for them to defend everybody in that bunch and sufficiently small to allow everybody in that bunch to get food in the surrounding areas. If the bunch became too large, the population not had, a, as in Bangalore, there is I think one crore or something like that, uh, you know, that, that would be unsustainable uh, un, uh, in contemporary terms, sustainability, transparency, accountability. 800 to 900 persons in one population, not a thousand persons, typically. And if they stay there from 65,000 years to 12,000 years, from 12,000 years before our time to 8 or 9,000 years, in 3,000 years, their speech inherited from the ancestors, their ancestors, their predecessors, acquired a different tone, different texture, became a different language. If you were to look at the uh, population dispersal in India from where these groups further migrated, you find certain locations, from the, particularly in the central part of India, particularly where there is a greater provision of tribal population from where they move out. These they are new languages. I am talking of the years, 12,000 years before our time, till about 6,000 years before our time. 6,000 years is a long time for these languages to come up. About 6,000 or 7,000 years before our time, agriculture started spreading from Iran to India. Now why did it come from Iran to India? Why did it not go from India to Iran? Because India was Vishwa Guru and all that. But, I mean, at the moment we leave that question of Vishwa Guru also. It's, it came from Iran to India because agriculture was not a, 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 a funded project of people. It was a need for survival. Where there was shortage of resource, food resource, people had to look at how plants behave and then replicate those plants. And that's how agriculture grew. and seed culture started. As food shortages started cropping up in areas where there was food sufficiency, people learned those techniques of harvesting, of, of uh, growing, cropping, sowing, uh, working there, cultivating land, which they had not done before. And therefore, Late arrival of agriculture is not a sign of backwardness. It is a sign of your having sufficient food at home prior to that time. So don't feel insulted that agriculture came to us from Iran. Uh, actually, we had enough food, enough, uh, enough fish, enough uh, 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 birds, enough animals to eat. When agriculture came, people developed terms in their local languages for the implements, tools, plant varieties and animal varieties. They also developed terms to understand this new behavior of humans. The, the, why was the behavior new? Till then humans were not bending their spine so much. I mean the, the, uh, humans are extremely reluctant to bend uh, when I was a uh, school going child in a village, my teacher knew this and every time I made a mischief, I was made to bend down and hold my toes. The punishment is horrible. Agriculture requires you touching the earth. The physical posture change. With every technology, the bodily posture of humans has changed in history. That form of labor also brought in new terminology. I mention all of this because it was about 1400 years before Christ, that is 21 centuries, 
after Christ, 14 centuries before Christ, 35 centuries, 3,500 years before our time, Sanskrit arrived here. But much prior to that, for several thousand years, in dozens of languages, Indian languages, there were terms related to agriculture and nature. When Sanskrit arrived here, 1400 years before our time, Pali was already taking advanced shape and Buddha could actually advise people using Pali and some Prakuts. Mahavir Jain could advise people, speak to people in Prakuts. Proto-Dravidic was in existence because there were people in the south, in Karnataka and in Tamil Nadu, the people for the last 45,000 years and it is not as if they were never speaking. They spoke. They related to nature. They understood the cosmos. They had language. They had consciousness. And they had the phenomenal reality. The Dravidic world, the Pali world and the Prakrit world were fairly well developed by the time Sanskrit touched the shores of India. I will now come close to my conclusion. So, uh, Samira or someone will have to tell me when to stop. Uh, have I crossed time? Already? I have crossed time. I'll say the last sentence. I'll say the remaining things tomorrow. What do you think? Five minutes? We started late. We started late. I'll complete this point. You know, the, this is of interest uh, to everybody in India uh, because the way we are shaped. It is in the second millennium, millennium means thousand years, second millennium before Christ, that India becomes a melting pot of languages. You know, our national food should have been khichdi. Everybody likes it. I mean, you mentioned curd rice with, uh, with uh, and you know, with uh, uh, lemon uh, pickle, sugar added to it. Is a new version of Kichdi. We became a language Kichdi. We became a language mix. Sanskrit came because horses were cultivated in uh, Euro Eurasian steppes. Wheels were known, and so people tied wheels to the horses and formed cars that could carry them at a fast speed by then arrows were known and this became a very rapid assault weapon that brought those people here on an expansion spree and they brought Sanskrit language with them. This language and its encounter with the local languages that were there created a new philosophical quest in India, a new question about existence. And you will notice that from the, from the 7th century before Christ till the 4th century before Christ, those 400 years, 7th, 6th, 5th and 4th centuries, the best of the philosophical literature was produced in India in the Upanishads in Sanskrit, in the, uh, uh, in the Buddhist uh, tradition and in the Jaina tradition. But also here the first Sangam is 7th century before Christ. There is a record in Tamil. I mean those of, of you who speak Tamil. Those four centuries were producing new thought, new questions and open society willing to accept many people, many languages coming in from many directions. And that, that churning changed the world view of India. That became the moment when Indian civilization came into, uh, came into being. And therefore the foundation of Indian civilization is the language mix. My last sentence, we have not stopped that moment till today. We have today in India, in 2011 census, which is the last census, you, uh, you know what census, census is counting of heads. And so counting of heads that, uh, I mean this time 20, 2021 census has gone on a sabbatical leave. 
uh, or some nature cure, uh, no census has taken. 2011 census. The number of mother tongues mentioned by Indians were admitted mother tongues. There were many not, not admitted. Admitted mother tongues by Indians in 2011 were 1,369. 1,369 mother tongues Indians claim as Indians. There is no other country in the world, including Papua New Guinea, which was supposed to be having more languages, Nigeria and Indonesia, which have great profusion of languages. No other country in the world has so many languages. Living language. When I counted living languages in India, I came across 780 living languages in the country. And I missed on many. I must also add very quickly that 50 years ago, in 1961, when the census took place, the number of mother tongues was 1,652. That means in 50 years' time, we lost 1,652 minus 1,389. Difficult. <laughs> but roughly 275 languages died, which means the great Indian civilization, which is a linguistic civilization, is being pushed by you and me. No, actually, me and you. I am more responsible than you are. The great Indian civilization founded on language mix and language diversity is being pushed by me and you towards its grave. I shall speak tomorrow about the language diversity, how much it is, and why we are in a mad act of pushing Indian civilization towards a grave exactly at the same time when we are also pushing the other biodiversity to its grave. We are equally, I mean equally enthusiastically destroying biodiversity and language diversity. I feel sad about it. But uh, tomorrow and after tomorrow, we'll think about uh, why this has happened and what possibly can be done to get out of this. With this, I thank you. I also thank you for tolerating me for the excess of time. Uh, and uh, I stop this. that blew my mind was when you said that a language acts the same way as uh, neurons or the brain does. Just like the brain processes stimuluses and collects it, language sort of acts as a societal collector of impressions. Um, I was curious based on that, uh, in collecting uh, what all is happening, languages would end up collecting foundational stories. Uh, what you described of the triangle and the parallel lines are also foundational stories of the Egyptian and Greek civilizations. So, what is your thought on how in a place that has so many diverse languages, um, what does that then have to do with the kinds of foundational stories that we have and uh, how do we keep up that diversity of foundational stories? Uh, there has been a di dialectical process. Uh, so many of many of the people in this country believe that OM is the source. Actually, it's a word. It's 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 a it's a, it's a phoneme cluster, which has no meaning. But people have their shraddha, astha, I respect it. But parallel to that, there is another tradition, and that is. You might have heard of the Mahabharata. Uh, the, in the first book of the Mahabharata, there is a story about telling of the Mahabharata. The first recitation of the Mahabharata is reported in the Mahabharata's uh, Adi Parva. 
that rec that recitation takes place in uh, a uh, in a college in a national and uh, some terribly weird looking fellow say me comes to that ashram and uh, uh, st starts uh, singing a story and all the kids all the students uh, forget everything else they were doing and listen to him when he stops they say please don't stop tell the complete story he says ashta dashas this is sanskrit please pardon me for using it because it's also one of the languages अष्टादश सहस्राणि अष्टादश शतानि च अहम व्यक्ति शुको व्यक्ति संजया व्यक्ति वानवा शुक नोज एट थाउजंड एंड संजया ऑल्सो पर हैव्स नोज एट थाउजंड लाइन्स ऑफ दिस स्टोरी बट माय लाइन्स आर डिफरेंट फ्रॉम व्हाट संजय नोज संजय लाइन्स आर डिफरेंट फ्रॉम व्हाट शुक नोज हु इज शुक शुक इज ए हॉर्स कीपर Sanjay is a half Brahmin, and this man, who has come from the forest, is actually—I don't like to describe him this way, but uh, allow me uh, as an exception—a tribal, a forest dweller. So, a forest dweller knows the story, part of it. A half Brahmin knows part of the story. A, a somebody who is uh, animal uh, you know uh, uh, keeper knows uh, i mean a, a veterinary expert veterinary expert knows a third part of the story many stories were always together india does not have a single story single origin and a complete story the indian story is perpetually unfinished perpetually diverse and completely democratic that everybody stories allowed every tribe has story of origin but in india they do not stand out as uh, you know as odd people unless some government rule wants to level them government uh, regulation calls some of them primitive tribes i mean it's shocking we should be protesting against this the other day i went to uh, orissa juang tribe in the juang juang village Uh, this is uh, Kionjar district on a hill. I uh, when I went to that village, there are about 30, 40 houses. There was one house which belonged to nobody, but in that house, slightly raised above the ground uh, on a raised platform, a log was burning, very long log. I said, why is it burning? Did somebody die? Is this a cremation? Or they said, no, no. We keep this log. in fire in burning state all the time when one log is over we put another log i said how do you get these logs is there no short sub they live in forest they said we have we have a ceremony for planting trees where the third generation will get logs from that tree every grandfather plants a tree for the granddaughter every grandmother plants a tree for the grandson i said uh, but uh, you mean this fire has never gone out they said no in our memory we do not remember a time when this fire did not exist which means this fire belongs to the times before 12000 years prior to our time that is their story that is their story in india we allow that story to be there except for this you know regulations which want everybody to be alike uh, there is often uh, a a strange kind of noise coming called unity in india unity in india a unity in india is a good idea except that when there is unity india will not be there because india is diversity Only diversity. I am saying 1,300 languages. That means th every every language is a unique world view, looking view of looking at space and time. We got about 13, 1,400 ways of looking at space and time. That's fascinating. There is one more thing. As you know, I have been spending time in the biology institute, and I learned there. 
though Darwin is made illegal in India, I learned there that evolution can progress only if diversity is around. Because the evolutionary energy chooses some, you know, it, it's, it never goes ahead in straight lines. Evolution is not like a flyover built here. You know, it's, uh, it's, it's nature's intelligence working to choose different attributes by dropping off some older attributes, acquiring new attributes without losing identity. And therefore, diversity is necessary for our progress. We have many stories, many stories. Greece had, unfortunately, one and the only story. And all the others in Greece who wanted to have other different stories were punished as discarded gods. Discarded gods. A god of the sea, Poseidon, was treated as a cursed god. A psyche, psyche, you know, the, uh, we, for the mind we use that term, it's a Greek mythological figure. That's a, that's a punished girl. Psyche was a very lovely girl, uh, dreaming of a lover who is to visit her, you know, off and on without anybody else knowing. Suddenly they decided to, she was, she was found allowing this lover's visit and she was punished. And since then, uh, in the Western world, the mind became a close affair. Yeah. Uh, for every short question, I'm going to give a long answer. So three, three times before you Hi, Professor. Uh, great talk. So my question is about, we are talking about like uh, the philosophy uh, in some uh, centuries. It, it showed more complexity, you were saying, you know, uh, different languages were there, like Prakrit and all these languages were there. So, uh, my question is about, like, uh, as you said in your uh, recent answer, that this languages were the outlook of how people see time and space, and the, uh, from there the philosophy come up. So, uh, what is the reason of this complexity? It was because of the interaction between all these languages taking place? Or is there any different reason for that? You can touch? No. Uh, I, as a student, I had to study modern European history. And I used to ask my teacher this question as to why did Europe progress so much? But the answer given was, Europe was acutely aware that it lacked something. And so they decided to go to the world outside to find what they lacked. The ability to feel humble, to accept another as a welcome guest, is a sure key for progress in thought. Our sciences, our philosophy, our literature developed. Whenever we welcome somebody, I'll give you two or three instances. I mean, Sanskrit was welcome in India, like nobody's business. So was Persian welcome in the 16th, 17th, 18th century. Persian was as good as our national language. And there was a great blossoming of literature. Your Mira, Kabir, Tokara, your so many great writers came. We accepted the English language. You know, we were crazy. At the beginning of the 19th century, some Bengali people went to England. Rajaram Mohan Rai spent 16 years there. He camped there and met every MP, pleading with the MPs, please come and teach us English. We welcomed that language and we gained a lot. So, welcoming the other allows one's mind to open up. But when we stop welcoming and we start hating and we say, we won't allow any people to come from Bangladesh into Assam, they won't be our citizens. I think we are driving ourselves close to the end of curiosity. End of curiosity. Any teacher, no? you have many teachers, this I'm saying. 
teachers who say they don't know the subject but they are actually exploring the subject with you are among the very best teachers. Yes. So, nice talk. It's a very broad subject that you are discussing. 12,000 years. Contest, contest it into an hour and we all know that that means leaving a lot of things, a lot of lopa. And uh, suppose my question is, what allows you to, for instance, do that? This kind of large generalization, how can you justify it? Because after all, it takes uh, leaving out a number of things for that to happen. And also what makes you think of Egypt, Greek and Indian civilizations in the way that you did. For instance, I think there is a fairly good argument that Greece also was linguistically advanced when you go back to its epics and had, uh, I mean, the dating may be a little off and on because Mueller, who dated all of these things, believed in the Bible's uh, origin, Genesis, and so there's some talk about that being off. But what I mean broadly is what allowed you to conclude that these were the three paradigms the triangle, the parallel line, and language. Even though language is common to all of these civilizations that you mentioned and every civilization that has really ever existed to some extent. Thank you for that question. I mean, I gratefully asked that question. Uh, one thing is to reduce it to one hour was not my choice. Uh, but I mean, I, I would love to go on speaking for hours and hours and hours. Very fond of that. But as, as etiquette, I mean, protocol of this meeting. And uh, 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 please allow me to promise the audience that I'm going to punish the audience for two more hours tomorrow and after. So this is not the last. But about the, uh, I mean, the, my conclusion about the, the Greek and the Indian and the Egyptian is based on the assumption that in a society, anesthetic and aesthetic form a spectrum that is the curing and the taming of the physical anesthetic and the exciting and the celebration of the senses, aesthetic, I mean anesthetic and aesthetic. The one deals with control of pain, other management of pleasure. Therefore, look, therefore, coming to the heart of any civilization, if one looks at which have been the most influential theories of pain and pleasure in that society, uh, one can get fairly close to the heart of the matter. Uh, in Greece, Aristotle wrote uh, uh, his treatise on poetry and for us two very great minds. One is Tolka Piyar of Tamil who come, I mean if there somebody called Tolka Piyar existed, Tolka Piyar, great text and uh, Bharata's Natya Shastra, Bharat Muni's Natya Shastra. In uh, Poetics of Aristotle, the idea of beauty or pleasure coming out of beauty is explained by the artist's ability to create an ideal object. When I asked what is this ideal object, the answer that the Greek literature gives is the, the object up, up there in the domain of perpetual light, it will never die never perish. Whereas chairs in this world are made and they collapse. But a chair or a table in that world will never collapse because death does not touch it and therefore it is ideal. Ideal in that philosophical sense, not in our popular sense of ideal. The artist's job as determined by uh, Aristotle was to imitate that ideal 
and therefore his theory was called mimesis, imitation theory. For us, we have in the Natya Shastra the rasa having many varieties. Uh, that is, vibhatsa also can be rasa. Uh, Shaurya can be rasa. But Bharat takes care of explaining the creation of rasa in terms of linguistic style of creating that rasa. He talks of the tropes and the metaphors that will generate the rasa. Not some ideal outside this universe. On the basis of this treatment of the pleasure and the pain spectrum in these two societies, articulated by the mightiest of the philosophers in respective civilizations, I arrived at that conclusion. As far as the Egyptians are concerned, I have not had the chance to study Egyptian philosophy, and I based my uh, premise on the uh, experience of traveling through Egypt and by analyzing the visual culture of the Egyptians. Unfortunately, a lot we know about Egypt comes to us in second-hand European source. You now somebody like Emil Durgin will write History of Nile, and, uh, but I don't think Egyptians looked at the Nile people with the same eyes as a German scholar looked at. Uh, but uh, I uh, accept my limitations. However, to build a grand theory about the universe is necessary in times when the hearts and the minds are sinking and getting kind of uh, maroon into petty, divisive times. Thank you. I think we have time for two more questions. Uh, one question. Perhaps the youngest member. Yeah. So, first of all, a very nice talk. It was splendid. And I wanted to ask is there a connection between the diversity, sorry, biodiversity and the number of languages? Yes. One to one connection. Hmm. I'll tell you, what is your name? What is your name? Vihan. Viham. Vihan. Vihan. Okay. Uh, that is uh, one who soars in the sky. No, no, Vihan. 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 Yes. I, I, okay, I heard Vihan. Okay, Vihan. There is a connection between biodiversity and language. And, uh, and uh, just as humans have stopped, which language do you speak at home? English and Hindi. Hindi. जैसे इंसान एक दूसरे को सुन नहीं रहा, ऐसे इंसान पेड़ों को, फूलों को, पत्तों को, कीड़े, मकोड़े जो है, कीटक, उनको सुन नहीं रहा है, वो चिल्ला रहे हैं, हमें जीने दो। देखो, मैं एयरपोर्ट से बेंगलुरु में आया, और एयरपोर्ट के बाजू में बहुत अच्छे फूल के पेड़ हैं, पंगे हैं। लेकिन उस रोड पे लाखों गाड़ियाँ कार कार जाओ तो उनके दुए से वो फूल मरते हैं एक तरफ गवर्नमेंट वो फूल लगाते हैं उसपे पैसे लगाते हैं बड़े होर्डिंग्स लगाते हैं ब्यूटीफुल बेंगलो और वो गाड़ियाँ उनको मारने का काम करते हैं उसके लिए रास्ते बनाए तो ये हम लोग सुन हम बहेरे और अ you don't mind my calling you bacha? <laughs> I hope not. I don't. So, I was watching fireflies in my small village. Fireflies. They are very low. They are very low. They are in our NCBS campus. They are very good. They are not seen in Bangalore. I think a society which loses its fireflies loses its desire to keep life intact. और उस समय लोग एक दूसरे से बातें नहीं करते, फिर वो अपने मोबाइल से बात करते। मेरे बहुत सारे दोस्त सुबह उठते ही मुंह आँख खुलती है तो मोबाइल की तरफ देखते हैं। और जब सो जाते हैं तो हम बच्चे थे तो हमारी दादी, माँ, नानी कहानी कहती थी हम कहानी सुनते आजकल हम सो सोने के एक सेकंड पहले 
अंतिम मोबाइल मैसेज देख के अलार्म लगा के फिर सोते तो हम मोबाइल के अंदर घुस गए हैं हम समाज से दुनिया से उठ के मोबाइल के अंदर वर्चुअल उसको बोलते हैं वे एंटर द वर्चुअल वर्ल्ड इिवर्सिबली और उसमें से बाहर आना बड़ा मुश्किल बन गया है और उस वर्चुअल वर्ल्ड में आर्टिफिशियल पत्ते पौधे फूल खिल सकेंगे लेकिन असली फूल पत्ते पौधे नहीं होंगे ये बात है सो यू आर राइट भाषा ये जीवन जिंदा रखने का तरीका है लेकिन आजकल हम एक दूसरे से बोलते नहीं मैं बस में जाता हूँ तो सब लोग अपना मोबाइल देखते हैं कोई भी एक दूसरे से पहले हम ट्रेन में घूमते थे तो एक दूसरे से बात करते अब कोई बात नहीं करते बातें बंद हो गई है और केवल डिजिटल वर्ल्ड हमारे लिए खुल रहा और ज़्यादा ऐप आता रोज एक नया ऐप आता है रोज एक नया ऐप बट यू चेंज द वर्ल्ड वेन यू ग्रो मेक इट डिफरेंट आस पीपल टू स्टॉप यूजिंग देयर मोबाइल्स एट डू यू यूज मोबाइल ओके थैंक यू It's a lovely poem by William Wordsworth. Yeah. Uh, my heart leapt up when I beheld, uh, uh, behold a rainbow in the sky. So it was when I was a child. So it is now that I am man. So it will be when I grow old, etc., etc. Because the child is the father of man. वो बचपन खोने का तरीका ये मोबाइल जो बच्चे मोबाइल यूज़ करते हैं वो अपना बचपन खो देते हैं. So thank you very much for a great talk. I just wanted to add because I guess from my field I have to feel contribute something because you must have you would have come to it already uh, if you had the time and as you said earlier. Um this binary thing it seems like uh you know always imposed upon the <laughs> Yeah. So the binary aspect has has been always constantly being dwelt on whenever we talk about the Western civilization as such. I mean, the post-structuralists have shown that many of these other non-binary ideas, or the Dionysian part, because the one you spoke about was the Apollonian one. So those have been like meddling with this non non-binary aspect, or the non-binary has been. uh meddling with the binary as such and so i i thought that i should kind of talk about it uh, you can also you know say your comment as such but uh, it's just my concern because many times the knowledge surfacing uh, is only because of certain power and discourses that happen to be uh, you know somehow managing it kind of a thing and these other kind of thoughts in any culture for that matter seems to be like submerged and repressed and uh, sometimes these kind of works the post structural ones seem to pull out these repressions and then express it and so on it's just that we didn't pay attention to the message thank you sure thank you i love it thank you for listening to this series or if you feel fond of reading to go to the etc etc Uh, but for last 30 30 30 35 years i uh, decided to listen to the adivasis i spent several decades in a village listening to them and i learned that they have many things to uh, teach us uh, yesterday in that science discussion somebody was saying that knowledge may be short stock but they share it share knowledge even if it is little is more effective than large knowledge which remains unshared that was the view there uh, i think uh, the the logic of logically correct or logical or illogical uh, is not uh, is uh, does not reflect uh, the really the structure of uh, the cognitive revolution which made us humans uh, did not tell us any time that uh, you will have choice to be the true but the uh, but uh, in the in the west 
uh, this binary was rotting for the financial, legal, political purposes. Even we accepted, uh, you know, in elections we vote for somebody, uh, there is nota in none of the above. Uh, is uh, you know is not still popular. I belong to that nota group. 